Okay, it's there. So pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I've prepared a really nice introduction, but then in my conversation with Andraj, we said short it, short it, just present the company. So we focus on the demo, which is a very <laughs> comprehensive demo based on the list that you have provided in the in the RFI. We've tried to follow it uh, as much as we could, but we've made some uh, structure uh, around it. So it has some story and then uh, some slides to explain a bit the technicalities and the questions that you've had. As Asa has mentioned, uh, feel free to write the questions in the chat. We might answer some of the questions directly in the chat if they're more simple, simple enough. And for any more technical questions, Andraj will then I will I will interrupt him and ask him a, a question, read out loud, and he will respond uh, to it. So to present myself, my name is Jovan Pavicevic. I'm the International Markets Director here at Better now almost for seven years. And with me is Andraj Kujel, his software development uh, lead, who will be doing the demo and be, I hope, the star of the show. And Petar Abajic is also with us on the call to help us with the with the questions, answers, and well, the, the team in the background also, which might be helping with these uh, things. So the agenda is quite packed. Uh, short introduction from my side, and then I'll leave it to Andraj. Uh, he will briefly present the architecture. We will go to practical demos, one on the, let's say, uh, clinical portal, a bit of a, the, the patient uh, more um, portal or applications, just very briefly, and then the set of tools, uh, how to build actually all of these uh, screens and how the, the platform works. And then we will focus on a backend stuff, which we will try to show some, but majority of them will be on the on the slides. Q&A during the, the presentations, but also we can have some time afterwards. So about better. Uh, for those that don't know us, we are a company for now over 30 years in the market, previously known by the name of Morand, where we were also working in other industries. Now there is 160 of us uh, crazy about healthcare, fully focused on healthcare, trying to make not the best applications, but definitely the better ones, uh, systems and, and platforms. We are now in uh, 18 or now actually 19 markets. We've also managed to, to get the fifth continent, the North, North America. And we worked with a number of uh, partners uh, to more than 100 uh, clients here in Nordics. Uh, we work mainly with uh, Tieto, Tieto Every. We're in Finland, we have more than 60 deployments now in uh, 16 regions out of 21. Uh, but we also work closely with EY globally, with Microsoft and others. Uh, we do also in Sweden now, started especially last week in Vitalis, had a number of discussions with smaller partners, uh, which are working in particular regions that are trying to build up their open EHR knowledge. Uh, and I think it's 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 important and a, and a really good thing, actually, for the Swedish uh, community. There is a number of companies that are looking into it. Just a, a, a selected list of, of clients. I would say the biggest clients of us is uh, definitely NHS in, in the UK, where more than 20 trusts are using our, our solutions. But as said, we are uh, all over the, the Europe. So in, in Spain, in Germany, where we have nine hospitals, you may have seen also yesterday a news. We've signed now the medication management for all of the Catalan uh, hospitals, or the 68 of them. So we are growing uh, in, in, in Europe, but we also have some uh, wild or far destinations. So we have a case in Nigeria, we have Australia, New Zealand, US, so trying to be global and share these experiences from all of these different uh, markets. Our mission is um, to simplify the work of healthcare teams. And I wouldn't say only healthcare teams, but also those that are developing for healthcare teams. All of the tools that you you will see uh, today are actually meant for, I wouldn't say developers, but those that have intention to develop. And we can see more and more non-developers now using the tools and actually hospitals and regions using the tools to deliver the, the use cases and not anymore only only the, the partners in here. My motivation to all of you is to, to dare and start building your own stuff because I think the technology is definitely, definitely there. The two offerings that we have, the first one we will spend today uh, a lot of time to discuss about is the Better Platform. And the second one is the medication management system, the Better Meds, which is an inpatient and outpatient medication management uh, system deployed across uh, either hospitals or also regions, uh, regions uh, cities, 
uh, or multiple, let's say, uh, hospitals that are uh, sharing the information between them themselves. Okay, better platform. Uh, it's uh, the, the digital health platform concept actually has been um, let's say named, framed by Gartner a couple of years ago, and it's actually three things. The first one is the vendor neutral data core. So this is where all of your patient data stays uh, and it resides in a vendor neutral format. And we say that this data should be stored for life. So not for the life of a system, not for the life of, uh, of an institution, but for the life of the patient and even beyond that. The second one is the set of low code tools and uh, clinical content being it the applications, uh, archetypes, templates, widgets, forms, anything that you can use with a set of tools to assemble the clinical uh, use case or the patient facing application. And then uh, where you assemble it is the, the portal. And we have also a design system. So a, a unified patient or clinical experience, clinician experience where it all comes uh, together. The better plot platform is a technology can be then used in several scenarios. So let's say product positionings, one of them being the clinical data repository, which is mainly used by regions and, and uh, a, a bigger, let's say, um, environment. So countries also, our biggest implementation it measures over 10 million uh, patients in a single data data repository. So this is all about the clinical, clinical data. But then as mentioned, the second use case is the low-code platform where with a set of tools, uh, hospitals and regions start building on their own or with the help of, of vendors, mm -hmm. the clinical systems and the applications they need to use. The third one is the most recent one, is the care coordination uh, platform, which is uh, based on the technology, but effectively it uh, connects uh, by from, from centrally, let's say from the intraoperability level, connects all of the institutions, all of the entities in a single care uh, system so they can coordinate it between themselves not uh, with with institutions in the center but with the patient in the in the center in the center of it and the biggest one by far that we've implemented is the the one london case where we have connected more than 40 trusts five icss so these are like logical regional areas within london and more than 1000 gps into a single uh, care coordination uh, plan and the latest one is the operational data repository. This is uh, something completely new. So as you have clinical data repository for all of the clinical data, we have the operational data repository for all the patient and the institution related data uh, without the, the billing and the reporting information. So and, and then when you have the clinical and the operational data all together, and they both can work also in a kind of a federated setup at the regional or the ministry level, you can really have a nice overview over your healthcare uh, system. And using this, we have delivered then a number of different uh, solutions uh, together with our with our clients. That was my my short uh, introduction. You will have in the slides we will share them also some of the trends that we would like to share. But I skip this. We can talk in the end if if needed. So I would leave the word here now to to Andraj to go more uh, technical into these uh, pr presentations. Let me just see, I lost my mouse and I need to stop sharing there. Okay, uh, I I think my screen should be on now. Yep, and it's my cheat are. sheet. So let's start here. Uh, thanks, Jovan, for the introduction. Business time, let's do it. Um, I'm hoping to fit it all in the time slot assigned. So let's talk about better platform um, architecture. This is where it all starts. We need to know what I'll be, you need to know what I'll be presenting today and how it all fits together. First of all, what, what, what's the idea behind it all? It's a rather complex diagram that you have here, but it represents the idea, some com com components of the better platform and um, how it actually works together. Now, we're gonna, we're gonna start at the at, at the center central part here because we are data oriented data centered and the core data services that the better platform brings in it focuses on is the components such as ehr server which is our clinical data repository built according to the open air specification and the rest about it usually 
is a client to this um, CDR or uses it in, in different ways for different other purposes. Now, other services that we also incorporate are document store or interfaces to other document stores, binary store for storing data, such as images, audio, video. And mind me, these are all the services that you can employ. You can use those provided by the better platform. But if you're building something around an existing ecosystem, we can integrate with those as well. Because if you pay attention to it, everything below this line is exposed through the APIs, which means we have great uh, integration capabilities. Now, um, besides the clinical data, there's demographics or master patient indices or operational um, data uh, repository, which Jovan just mentioned. And we're using a fire server for that. I think it's important to mention that because open air and fire do work well together and we've embraced that and used it as the standards we would like to pursue and um, uh, our clients we think as well terminology server again optional if you already have a solution but other components like access control workflow decision support data views innovation um efforts that we work with with ai research and uh, semantic linking um, and, and natural language processing and similar um they're not necessarily end products which are part of it but they which are part of the platform but they offer services and features which can be included and configured according to the need our clients needs of course with different interfaces as i mentioned the integration capabilities also uh, allowing for inter interacting or migrating the legacy data, um, taking care of patient generated data, data generated by devices or IoT um, sphere, or connecting to external data services, whether being cloud, other servers, whatever needs to be done. So across mapping integration uh, capabilities, we bring all of that into our CDR. Now, on top of that, because these are basic functionalities, we already have modules such as laboratory viewer and order management, allergies, dashboards, document viewers, medication management, which are either standalone, some of them are standalone applications, or they can be integrated in third party solutions. One of these third parties, well, it's not third party, it's our portal environment, which I'll be demonstrating shortly. So it's higher level functionality already. Uh, pre-built and ready to be used, but whatever might be missing and how you combine things together, this is where the power of our EHR studio is really um, uh, shown because uh, I'll, I'll show you how to configure things, how to introduce logic, how to work with data, how to create user interfaces, all of that within the studio. And once you have either content, whether it's an application or pages or something simpler, you can also, not just ours from coming from better, but also third party applications, we can wrap it up within the portal, which exposes your typical functionalities such as user management, patient management, yeah. patient lists, um, care plan, registries management, and similar. And then, of course, you provide the content and the functionality from all the um, boxes I listed here. Let's not forget single sign-on capabilities, identity providers, different authentication systems all along the solution together with content management and governance behind it together with design system all across. So uh, without any further ado, let's start from the end backwards. So I'll show you what probably everybody wants to build a version of it, a portal, a user, something user facing, because all of these things behind the API, they're mostly services. So you have to build something for user to work with. And I'll show you our portal, uh, which is one of such solutions uh, that, um, let's see what's, what uh, the capability of this is. Of course, first of all, uh, bringing your patients to the, to the front end. Uh, the patients here are collected from our demographical services. Now, Portal on itself doesn't have a database on its own. It 100% relies on the services and servers and functionalities behind it. So it's just a wrapper that gives the user interface to it all. There's a bunch of patients, me in this case, representing a doctor have been working with, if we take one of my favorites, Alice, I get all the information about Alice coming from our demographic service and server and also operational data, such as general practitioner contact, contacts. So anything to do also with scheduling, 
um, we have the information whether she's hospitalized or not, where, where's her location, and all the details. As you see, the allergies information is here. So the allergies module is embedded in the portal and specific alerts here as well. So everything important in one place. As I mentioned, document viewer is one is a solution internal that attaches to any backend, document-based backend, and also our clinical data repository. Because if there are entries in one, we can extract that uh, data, which is structured, present it on screen like that. If there were PDFs created or other documents, we can go and grab those. We can present them in document viewers. So again, a standalone solution integrated in the in the portal. Medication management is a standalone solution, which is firing up now here. But you see, for our Alice Murphy, this is her ongoing therapy. You can manage all of these entries, overview it. I could do a whole demo on this, but I don't want to lose time. But as you see, the data is all stored in the CDR. The application is standalone, but integrated here. No iframes, all done with native embedding into the web pages. Allergies modules as well. As you saw this, I could go and edit the current state. This is an in-place document containing all of the allergies or adverse reactions related data. Now, besides these modules, which can be uh, any other as well, as long as you can integrate, which offer enough integration capabilities, there's one important page, which I call the patient summary. This one, as you see, contains all the necessary information for the doctor to have a first glance impression what's going on with the patient. With a number of widgets which you can configure on how they behave, they can capture data from the CDR, they can show you the historical values, that you can access the documents where these values come from, you can visualize them either in charts, in spark lines, depending on what kind of data it is, you can set up this page to your own likes. So these are the tiles you can move around, you can decide which you want, which you don't want, you can create your own. Just query the data, configure how the data is collected, bring it to the front end, and the widgets do the rest because they know how to behave according to what data you feed them. Now, pathology results, this is the laboratory test results. Basically, you have, again, the similar overview of what's going on, the trends, the classification of the data, the notifications, ranges, and so on. Coming from the medication uh, module, this is an, um, a widget that doesn't exist in portal, but this module brought the definition of it, and I can include the active medication list for our patient on the screen, together with procedures and assessments that have been performed for this specific patient. What are the assessments? Well, the assessments are the, are the core of it all because it allows you to fill in the data for the patient. For instance, rheumatoid arthritis diagnostic criteria is one of the uh, assessments or forms, if you will, uh, that we do uh, use regularly on patients. First of all, the, patient, the, the portal recognized that there were previous entries, asked if we want to pre-fill the form from the historical entries. The, the answer is no, because I want to do this from the very beginning. And the first, the, this page, you see, it collects, it calculates the score of the entries. So what is actually the current patient state? And you can record it just by submitting this data. But depending on what you choose, if the score reaches a certain threshold, there's an option to go to the second page where data is collected from the CDR, put on the form for the doctor to review. Uh, you can get the instructions as well. And then the second part is to mark which joints are problematic. As you see, the counts are happening automatically here. This DAS score is calculated and also the assessment uh, provided. I can submit this data and the data has been stored for this patient. The assessment archive shows that there's an entry, the latest entry of for this patient, and I get the information here. Uh, what, what, is, um, what data was entered? Well, it's not complete data because I've been playing around and um, I messed this presentation up, but I'll, I'll show you later how I messed it up. Um, anyway, before we continue, the question typically here, usually here is, um, how can you design the content? How can you provide the information? How can you uh, bring all of these functionalities within the portal or any third party um, uh, EMR you might be building because 
uh, majority of what you see on screen can be embeddable in third party solution as well. Let me show you how this is done. For this, we go into our studio environment. I mentioned it earlier already. And with stu within the studio, we have the form builder, which is our um, application for uh, user interface building. We're going to be building a new form from scratch. So of course, for every form, for every every content in open air, it's model based. So it's model driven development. We've done that part already. And for a demo, I've prepared a template RFI demo, which is pretty simple one. It is about the vital signs, but we're going to be playing around with the content. So what do we do? We do support, mind me, building forms based on multiple templates. So you can combine different templates in a single form because the user interface is just a presentation for the user or the patient. That might be the case. They don't care how the data is structured in the back end. That, they, that shouldn't be their care. So we take care of that. So for, for a simple form here, I'm going to call this blood pressure measurement. And I, I believe you've seen it so many, done so many times, but I'll try to pinpoint what are the specifics you can afford uh, using our environment. So what's available to you? Um, okay, at this point, you know, a form as a form, once you get it ready, uh, you can always go to the preview where this form goes live. And uh, in, so we have forms in design time and lifetime. I can choose a patient from my list and I do type in some data, 123 over 77. And if I go and click save the composition, the data is stored in the CDR already. I got the composition ID back. So it takes you uh, this fast to actually create something and use it. Of course, it feels like this is the, the, the test environment. It should work, but I'll show you how fast you can get it into the portal or anywhere else. But what's good uh, about our forms system, which is that you can deploy it on different devices. So uh, fully responsive and um, we even with the complex layouts, it makes sure everything is reasonable and works uh, as intended. It does support multiple locales. So if I go to Finnish, if I go to uh, Swedish, I, if there's translations, you know, whatever, what you would expect from an open air based project, and with that, let, let's start, let's finish with a simple presentation at this point. What we're gonna do here now, this, um, this uh, form is simple enough, but you see the mean arterial pressure down here is something that you have to calculate the value of. And um, if we have it on a computer, why not employing the computer to do that for us instead of relying onto the doctor not to make a mistake, calculating not to make a mistake, uh, typing the data in, not to make a mistake, copying the data from somewhere else, if they're using an Excel workbook that does that for them, and so on and so forth. Usually, these fields are just skipped, but if the system can do it for you, the more data you have available, you don't have to recalculate it again and again in case you might need it. Now, mean arterial pressure might not be that important, but other use cases might benefit from this approach. What I'm talking about, let me show you. Let's make this form smart one. So if you have systolic and diastolic data available, you can calculate the mean arterial pressure. And we're gonna do that on the form itself by using our dependencies system. Dependencies allow you to introduce logic in the low code mode. It means you don't necessarily need um, a programmer at this point, because it's a point and click system, which allows you to get to some results. Let me show you what I mean. So basically you're introducing the triggers, the conditions and the activity you would like to have performed. At this point, uh, whenever some data changes in the fields I'll be referring to, this, if this dependency will be re-evaluated re again and again, and the results executed or performed. Let me show you how this works. So my condition is that if systolic magnitude is not empty and the requirement is that also the diastolic magnitude is not empty, we're going to do something. If that's not the case, I want the mean arterial pressure to be cleared out. So there's no confusion. Either I have both data or no mean arterial pressure. This is step one, unconditionally. Now, the activity. If I have both values, I would like for mean arterial pressure to set the magnitude to something. 
Now this something, let's talk about it, what this could be. I could um, evaluate this something based on any system-wide variables that the system offers me. If that's not the case, I could go and refer to any fields that are already on the, on the form. And if I want more, there's a number of math mathematical functions to manipulate the data here as well. But I have the option also to fire up an expression assistant, which will help me build my expression on how to calculate mean arterial pressure. And I've learned that the mean arterial pressure, look at that, start with the number of functions. These are functions copied from Excel worksheets because majority of people are used to those. So let's use them to our benefit. I'm gonna be rounding the result. That's the first part. So I'll be rounding what I have and I'm gonna click here on the form itself so I don't get lost in the menus. So I'm gonna take the diastolic magnitude and I will sum it with a one third of the expression, which is the difference of systolic magnitude minus diastolic uh, magnitude, right? Closing parenthesis, and then I'm gonna round it up to two decimal places. Finish, this is it. So I have a calculation here, which should produce a result. And since we do it more manually, I want to set this field, the mean arterial pressure field, to be um, read only, so in here, so nobody messes with the result. Let's go to the preview and see what's up. Look at that, it's hot loaded. So whenever I have data, so let's clear the form up. If I have 100 over 80, this is your mean arterial pressure. If I lose one of data, so there's no diastolic, I clear it out, so there's no error, there's no stale information on the form. So with that, I have now three values, and if I check how these values are, um, included in my in my clinical data document or composition in open air world, we say I have 150.66.66666 and so on. So if when I'm ready with the patient, I can save the composition. Composition contains all three values, even though I just input two of those. So with, with dependencies, I can manipulate data, I can calculate things, I can manipulate elements, show them, hide them, or groups of elements, I get access to the underlying model. So 100% um, access to it all, um, everything that you see on screen, which gives me great power, but is pretty straightforward point and click. So not necessarily uh, for, a, you need a developer for that. Somebody with a bit of training can get comfortable with this in a number of days, okay? So the next step would be a benefit of having a form based on a model, which is in connection with the underlying CDR, why not introducing extra elements on form? Of course, we can introduce images, text, separators, everything to make the form more visual appealing. I don't have time for all of that today. I don't want to afford time, but what I will do, I will bring up a button on this form. And why uh, I'm going to call it, I'm going to label it load data. And the idea with this is that if there's data that exists already somewhere, um, why not load it and pre-fill the form? Now, this, my demo form is pretty straightforward. It doesn't really feel like this, that's a necessity. And also you want to have blood pressure measurement uh, fresh each time around. But mm -hmm. if you remember in the portal, it asked me, do you want me to pre-fill the form from previous uh, entry, the answer is yes, no. But well, you can do that for smaller pieces, not, in, not necessarily the entire form. How this is done, that's what I wanna show you. Uh, so it's not necessarily clinically relevant, but I wanna show you from the technical point of view. So I wanna load some data and I will switch to the variables panel, which I, well, I can define some variables that I'll be working with on the form, some variables that will have the value injected into the form or AQL based variable. So blood pressure is something that's interest and I will base it on a AQL query, which can be packed into what we call an AQL view, which is server, so, server side stored query or any custom AQL. So we'll do that, we'll design it in our AQL builder, which is another tool within Studio. So I will just base my query on the same um, template that I have here. So what I wanna retrieve is systolic and diastolic. I wanna retrieve only a single one. And this is the query, I can test it. This is the value, which just happens to be the latest I've entered. Um, 
that's okay, query works, but I wanna bind it to the specific patient. So this is the query based on the EHRID value. As you see, the editor is full IntelliSense and um, equals the EHRID. Now EHRID is a parameter. This parameter, I can enter it here for testing purposes. But once I'm happy with my query, I can go back to the form editor and say, create query. Now, the idea here is, well, I have that EHR ID parameter, but in the external variables, there is a predefined variable called EHR ID that represents my patient. Why? When you deploy the form, usually you already know in the EMR, in the, in the application where the form is displayed, which patient you're working with, right? And that knowledge, that information, you, can, you, can, you inject it into the form via the external EHR ID variable all our system does it binds this variable value with the query parameter so this happens um, internally that's first step next step when button when i click the button i want to bring in some logic and the logic is when the button's clicked unconditionally set systolic magnitude to my variable which is uh, come on which is the blood pressure variable systolic part magnitude that's first step and the second one diastolic again set it to the blood pressure variable diastolic result magnitude with this let's go to the preview part and um, clear out the form switch to a patient load data this is the entry for this patient another patient has different data fourth third patient again a new data and you see mean arterial pressure is recalculated and everything reacts to changes happening on the form so what we did here is uh, query the data from the repository, filled it in into the form, and the rest happens as we programmed it earlier. And I say programmed it by clicking in the dependencies. That's, that's all you need. Okay, let's go back to our um, template and bring in the diagnosis part. Now, diagnosis name here is... Oh, there's a warning here. If I hover above it, it says it doesn't have any values configured because on the template side, it said it's going to be external data source. So we're going to bring in the value sets for this field to display. So now it's empty. In the content part of our editor, you see you can manually type in the values, but I, I don't want to recreate a whole ICD or a subset of any SNOMED value set. At this point, I would like to bring it in from a different data source. Um, so what do we do at this point? We have a terminology server running for our for my demo. I'll show you how we can bring in the, the information from that part here. So uh, uh, my cheat sheet here, this is the URL of my, of my terminology system. And what we do is I'm going to connect to that server. In my case, it's terminology server. But my API connector, this is the point where we can reach out and send requests or post data or ask for something else. We can interact with other APIs. Um, it doesn't really distinguish of which terminology server provider you have. You can, you can build your interface to any API. Okay. At this point, I want to build an API connector, which I'll be calling terminology server. And of course, this is where you handle all the authentication and the technical parts. But I want to add a call, which is called the get entities. And the URL, I'll paste it from my cheat sheet. If you pay attention, the value set is in the brackets, curly brackets, which means it's a parameter. That means it automatically extracts the parameter. I can provide some values here. I can make this call dynamic. I have an ICD-10 uh, terminology installed in this, in this, uh, in the on this server. So let's start our test call. What it happens is in the backend, we reach out, we ask the terminology server, tell me what's your pay, what does your payload look like? This is the actual payload. We extract the schema. You can type cast it, but this is basically the structure, an array of code description entries. And once we have that, we're done. All I'm all I have to do now is attach an API. To this, to this field and tell it my source is going to be all the items you will return and show the label. The description will be act as label and the code will act as the value 
All right, with this, let's go to the preview. And what I got here is a working terminology connector. And um, if I need different terminologies at this point on my form, I don't need to create new and new connectors if they, these terminologies are residing on the same uh, on the same uh, server. All I have to do, see this value set, I just provide the name of the terminology. I, I've got a body parts terminology in here. And let's check it out if this is when uh -huh, it's refreshed. Look at that. I got the body part terminology at this point. So it's pretty dynamic. And how can I fill in this value here? Well, um, you, you saw it earlier. I can use variables. I can calculate. Uh, I can do a lookup. I can do a secondary lookup, master detail lookup for any of these um, data structures at this point. Okay. So once we have this and allow me, I will, I want to go back to the ICD 10, the original one. I will save the form. I will do, the, I will save this form as RFI demo form. I'm going to activate it. I can enable the name localization. So this is going to be the RFI uh, demo in English. I want to do it also as RFI demo in German. So I gave it two, two, two names, two titles, basically, on how this form will be listed. When I save this form, what I've basically done is going back to our Miss Alice Murphy. If I click on the start the assessment, I should see the RFI demo EN English in here. Click on it. Click on the low data. Oh, there's some nasty demo data. Let's make it. <laughs> let's make it more reasonable. 120 over 65. Diagnosis name is I'm sorry meningitis. And while we're at it, click submit. And this is it. In the assessment archive, we see that we have the data in there and the data is presented in such a way we can read it in a label value way this is one way how we can uh, observe the data stored for the patient now another another um feature of this environment and the forms and everything that you see here is it supports multiple locales if so if i switch to german everything in my system or so the hosting app is in german if i can go and click and switch to my patient which again everything is here in german and if i say well let's start uh, an assessment you see now that i have the name of the form in german as well and if i open it up of course, it's in German, except for my button, because I forgot to provide the translation of the button label in German. How difficult would that be? I click on the button uh, and go to the labels, customize localizations. Here is the German part. I could just um, update it with this, save it again. We are ready to go. Click and it would show up. I almost forgot. There's one more thing I wanted to show you. Uh, this is where I messed up the rheumatoid arthritis presentation part. When I, when you build a form, you can have multiple pages form. Remember the rheumatoid arthritis? There was a first page with the assessment. If you reach the threshold, you went to the second page. And I can do the same here, but nevertheless, I can also create a summary. What is a summary? A summary is a, uh, you design a layout for data presentation. Uh, at this point, if you remember when, well, I, I got to switch back to English. Apologies. I do understand German, but English works for me better. Uh, if I go to the recent assessments for our patient and show the data, this is fixed. The data that we have, it have it's presented in, in, a, in such a manner. But maybe this data, somebody else, a patient wants to look at it, a doctor wants to look at it, a specialist wants to look at it in different context or different subsets of data, different layouts, depending on how you want to expose this. And we have this capability by designing the summaries. What we do here is, of course, you can bring in also the layouting options, which work for the form design as well, uh, where you can provide different uh, layouts, for instance, have access to the underlying uh, data and let's say systolic and diastolic. I want to design the layout to be like that. So when I save this again, and click save. Now the form would need to be updated. Uh, so ah, click the wrong button, of course. Uh, the the uh, starting the assessment wouldn't look uh, any different than earlier. But if I go to the assessment archive at this point, RFI demo would show me the data as I've designed the presentation for. So 
uh, this entry had a stale presentation. I didn't finish it up. So this is how you can combine. You can create multiple summaries and then linking to the user type, which summary you want to display. Patient sees something bare. A specialist needs to see more data exposed also based on what they can see, what they're allowed to see. Okay, at this point, we've been designing a clinical form. One of the topics uh, on your side was also uh, a patient-facing uh, patient form, and how do we tackle that? Let me show you. Uh, we have an application here, which, well, I just choose a patient. They could just uh, easily uh, log in. And there's a couple of, um, you see, data presentation. Again, widgets that we built with our form gives you an overview of what's going on, how's the patient's state, what's its earlier data. And there's daily observations and symptoms with telemedicine case where the patient can fill in this form. So again, 121 over 66, and there's a heart rate, there's a oxygen saturation, but I've got an idea. If we go to our studio here, and if we take a look at which forms we have here, I have also, I should have, not the active, but the use this one, the user, I should have the remote monitoring form, which is the one we've been looking at. So the blood pressure, the heart rate, the oximetry, and so on. What I want to introduce here at this point is a widget. And I've got, from a list of widgets here, I've got a pulse oximetry widget, which I installed in my environment, and I can drag drop it onto the form here. Now, this is a piece of logic and presentation. So what you see on screen, which was built outside of the form system. Our form builder doesn't know about what's going on in here. And we can build widgets with a specific functionality. You can build your own, you can publish them, you can manage them, you can put them on forms and use them. So if you build charts, if you build access to external services, so any pre-built pieces, you can just drop them on the form and you get an you get an uh, configuration option for these widgets as well. Now for this use case, what I wanted to do is, again, I have a cheat sheet here where I will take um, this code because we've, we've built this widget in a day, so we didn't really make it pretty for the interface. But what there is an option, instead of using the dependencies for programming something, we allow for custom scripting. Now, this scripting requires a developer, but it's a front-end developer, pure JavaScript, which is, but enhanced with our form API, which gives you, again, access to everything. Our dependencies are translated into these calls as well. And my script here, let's, let's check it out for my widget, which I will copy the ID in here. I got to link it. It says, this is my pulse field. This is my uh, oxygenation field. So these are the references to the fields within on the form. And there's a simple logic it says, listen to when the uh, widget um, emits a signal with the data. And if there's data, fill in the pulse rate and SpO2 uh, values. So this is my update to the form. So I save it directly. I go to our application here displayed. I will just refresh it. And you see that pulse oximetry um, shows up on the screen. What I've got here is a pulse oximeter. And I want to connect to this device. And here I do like that, pair it. And as you see in the top row, it's the live measurements. And once the this the, the, the device is done with the measurement and this is the these are the actual values. You see I'm quite excited. I can click on the button and the values are transferred to my form. Now, depending on what kind of device you have, you can connect it to the forms and automate the um, automated data capturing. Okay, you saw me. You saw me typing in the weight and look at that. The BMI has been down here has been automatically calculated. The height was retrieved from the CDR. There's calculation of the weight change. There's automatic timestamps. And I can click now, and then I can provide some other data about the patient's well-being and state. We have a well-being score down here. There's questions whether is there any problems. So I can say yes or no. Down at the bottom, uh, Bob can sign the can sign this form. We can attach 
uh, we can attach an image. Well, I'm just attaching a consent here, but anything goes and click submit at this point. You see the widgets are refreshed with the latest heart rate 108. We just entered that. So the data is fresh here. And not just that, I could go back to our portal and search for the patient, which is the Bob, Mr. Bob here. And uh, what we have here, one of the, well, it's it's an assessment here, but I can click on the patient summary and progress note, which is again, a form, which is mostly read only because it provides the information in here as aggregations and summaries. Look at those widgets, they're updated live. They provide all the information, also historical values. You have spark lines, you have the charts, uh, the overall um, statistics about the patient's state. If there's any data attached, you see, I just attached a consent at this point. These were previous attachments. And of course I can add a note. Now with these individual overviews, let's not forget there's other, there's other capabilities on the, um, on, uh, within our portal where I can access different modules views, but I also have, a uh, dashboard, so heart fail, failure dashboard, where I have for all my patients an easy, simple overview of their state about the weight difference. Is there a patient that needs special attention? He's the high risk. I can get in, in I can see what's their, his answers, his uh, assessment, and all the data necessary. If I click on it, of course, I get to the patient directly, and I can then further work with this patient. Um, at this point, um, this is how we can tackle clinical forms, how we can allow patients to provide data also from their devices uh, within, within, within the browser or within the application that you expose. You've seen me use the logic of it all. So uh, how to enhance these, these things? So not this, this thing, how to enhance the forms that we've been working on because the forms represent not just the data collection, part, but if I go back to portal uh, for a specific patient, which I know that um, I know that Miss Alice uh, has a number of encounters uh, from the past, so I can click on the activity and I can access directly our uh, operational data um, and uh, operational data data repository and extract this data about past and also future encounters information. Well, this one was future, today is already past. But this is data that's not clinical. How we've built this uh, using a form. So this was just activity form that we, of course, I need to disable the filters. Activity, well, this was a form I would build here with the connectors to our demographics that could get encounters, organizations, practitioners. You see these are fire resources. So we're connecting to a fire backend and bring it to front. Of course, when I start clicking on it, I can program what happens next at this point. Uh, how difficult is it to build all this together? Let me show you. So RFI form, the one we've built, I wanna put, I wanna put um, um, a, an extra thing here, another widget. Let me show you how widgets are handled. I've got a patient identity or patient banner widget available, which I will drag and drop on top of my, of my form. If this form were to be embedded somewhere else, uh, you always have the actual patient information always on top of the screen. And following our design system, you see the look and feel of all of our components is following the same uh, presentation, behavior, and expectations. So even if you switch between applications, uh, everything follows the central idea, less option, less chances for confusion. Okay, so we are at the widget here. Let's configure it. So this is our widget configuration facility where I could will provide a source. And a source could be, of course, I'm, I'm providing this again from demographics, which is a Firebase demographics um, server in the back. So first things first, I would need to provide an API connector to it. So let's go back and click API connectors, another one. This one is gonna be demograph, demographics. And my call would be get patient. By now you've realized how this all works. I have a patient ID parameter. I will fix it for my demo. Otherwise I could, I could provide it from another service. It could be injected and so on. So start test call. This is a patient 
resource returned from my server as you see here so i'm ready i got uh, i got the um the connector let's go and uh, attach it to this widget so what i do is say well my api why is this not refreshed let's try it again um apologies something might might have something happened um retry and the source should be the api oh <laughs> For God's sake, something is wrong. Um, I, I'll save the form and we're gonna reopen it. You know, I'll try just to close it and open it again. My Zoom controls in, are interfering. So let's do this again. Um, it's a live demo after all. So uh, let's do this. So content here, designs, featured settings, APIs, there's the demographics, get patient. And here it is. First name, what I will just click in and follow what's been offered from the response. And you see this, the name list, I'll take the first one. I can filter by keys, I can filter by values. So I can also do the complex operations on top of the payload. So I'll just take the first name and the first of the given names. And it should be see here charlotte it's live updated and i could go here go on like that for, from field to field but even better i got a preset here which linked all of these data to specific um to specific parts of the information except it's it's linked to an api which doesn't exist now so i will relink it to mine and with this look at that all i have to click is show the avatar and i want to have a compact presentation all right, it seems like this, this uh, preset doesn't have the photo part uh, ready. So the image data is in the photo, the first entry data part. Look at that. And once I'm happy, the image is there. Save the configuration and the widget is live over there. So that's how difficult it is to reach out. Well, not difficult at all, if you ask me. Uh, you don't need a programmer for this. We reached out with an API connector to the demographic server. We brought in a prepared widget. We have um, the, the presets. We just linked it together. And there's your data always on top of the form. Uh, save this. And of course, it will be presented in our portal as well, even though there's unnecessary for that use case. Now, um, OK, this we've done uh, about these widgets. When I click on the widgets, we see there's a content manager popping up. Content manager is something that we're introducing at this point, uh, which will allow any organization to uh, prepare the content in terms of widgets, plugins, forms, templates, views, uh, and uh, an administrator will prepare this piece, the, these resources and the users will share them. So if there's updates, all the forms can be updated with the, with a single uh, with the same plugin. If there's views, uh, there's views everybody can use. If there is, if we go back to form builder, each and every API that we define, I can make it global, which means that this call will be available for all the others forms. So I don't have to recreate it again and again and again. It becomes a central resource. If I have uh, access to it, I can reuse it again, which simplifies work a lot. Now, one piece of uh, one thing I did I didn't yet um, show you is the CDS part. You asked about it specifically, and I got a short demo here using the um, Abgar form. What I have here is the Abgar form, where if you take a look at it, well, let, let's 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 preview it first, and then I'll discuss it. So I can fill in the values at this point, but what do they represent and how to act on top of these values? I could program this into this form, but I would have to do it for every Abgar related form in my for my use case. I would rather have the decision part run on the GDL2 based uh, CDS system and ask it, well, this is the input data, what to do next? How do we proceed? And let me show you how this is done in this case. I have an API connector um, CDS here. Of course, I've got a, a backup call, but we'll build this from scratch. When I press this button, I want to send the data to the CDS and get a response back. So how do we do that? I'm going to create an AppGuard call, which is going to post some data 
to a specific URL. And the URL is this, where our CDS system um, is running the Abgar maternity um, GDL. So this is the URL, fine. So because this is a post um, request, I don't wanna actually send any data in case there's any entries created on the server because I'm still designing this system. What I can do at this point is the form builder allows me to mock the responses um, like that. So it's gonna learn about this from my JSON structure. I'm not executing any request outwards. So this is what to expect as a response. And now I have to define the payload as well. So my data, outgoing data to the CDS, again, uh, I will build, this is the actual payload that's necessary. But there's one little detail. If you take a look at the uh, specific parts about the skin color, ref reflex irritability, muscle tone, these are all placeholders within my payload. And the moment I paste it here, system recognizes it and says, what should I put in there? Which values? And let's take a look at that. Respiratory effort, again, I could choose from the list here. Or heart rate, I could go and click on the form itself. Muscle tone, it's the same expression assistant. So if you need something more complex, you can just click on it and link it uh, within, within the references. So I've done it. I've linked my values from the form into the payload. Test call is initialized using my response mock response, I think I'm ready. So my call is called Abgar and I have a script here. If of course it seems a bit complex, but it, you know, any front end developer will say we can work, make this work in half an hour. So what I do is I check all the data is present and I actually execute the Abgar call and extract two values, the magnitude, so the score and the assessment itself and put it on screen. So this part is complex. I could probably, I could do it in dependencies, but it would look like that. More complex interactions, easier for a script. You can afford a developer now and then, I'm sure. So let's save this and uh, go to the preview part. Same thing as earlier. I fill in the data, absent this one, normal tone, reduce response, pink body, and execute the CDS call in the back end. I got the score five and moderately abnormal. If I update the form and refresh, you see I got a different thing. If the score is high enough, that's fine. If the score is below a threshold, I can go to the next page and there might be, you know, this is clinically irrelevant. I just wanted to show you, showcase you that you can provide further instructions what to do. And of course, um, the sky's the limit. This one is asking for more. Uh, vital science data, of course, you can then submit the data, go back if you feel like you've done something wrong, and so on. So, so full navigation support here as well, per page validation, everything you might think of. At this point, I think I'm done with my practical presentation. I'm still hoping for 20 minutes for the rest of my two demos and some slides, but we got more than one hour deducting half an hour for Q&A. Um, let's 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 continue um, with the presentation itself. So, what I wanted to uh, talk about at this point and present to you is the ability. What well, this questions? Uh, what can super users do? What can administrators or technicians do? Let me just wrap it up in this: that we have the the API, which is the public API, open air based API, our own EHR. API, which is developers friendly because it compacts a couple of steps or works with bulk operations as well. And there's an administrative API, which is there uh, for users with specific role, administrative roles, because uh, it is used for entities management, such as domains, users, templates, forms, data sources, events, views, everything to do with the CDR. And also it exposes an API uh, endpoints for destructive and organizational actions like deleting EHRs, hard deleting, hard deleting compositions or specific versions. If there's been mistakes merging EHRs, moving documents between EHRs. So not your really day-to-day -day operations, but we have full support for that. If we go and take a look um, at this, so your basic, this is the EHR server, our CDR dashboard. 
your base, your um, setup about users, forms, domains, multi-tenant environment, events, views, and so on. There's your um, public API, administrative API to do with everything I've just listed. So with EHR, you see also have delete EHR, merge EHRs, move, unmerge, and so on, just to give you an example. Uh, next question was bulk operations, also on metadata involved. So it depends where metadata that you have you had in mind is actually stored. Clinical metadata probably stored within the EHRs and compositions itself in the feeder audit, something that OpenAir does by design. If there's metadata about the patient, about the organizational um, information, administrative metadata, it depends what kind of backend do you have. We have our Firebase server, so all operations are limited or uh, are based on the Fire API itself. So you take care of the data of where it's stored. It is stored between and federated be between different servers, but to each own because of their life cycle, because of separation of clinical and demographic and administrative and so on and so on. Bulk operations, bulk data import is available, bulk composition based operations. So creating new documents, uh, deleting, updating, uh, you can bulk retrieve uh, documents or based also on queries as well. So this is part of our uh, EHR API. So a lot of bulk operations um, supported out of the box. Integration and data extract capabilities. As you see, the integration capabilities is a lot of them. You, we've we've seen the IoT part in my in my presentation. HL7 MLLP protocol fire here as well through our integration engine. It sends the data where it's supposed to go. HL7 ADT to demographics, maybe to the clinical data repository as well, depending on messages and so on and so on. Important thing is that you can, of course, open air based query exposes raw data. We can expose data as fire resources. We can play as a repository in an IHEXDS based setup, document based. We have an R uh, SDK for research and business intelligence as well. And since these tools prefer to have data in relational database, SQL based, we have our ETL module for data export to that. So this is all data on demand. On the other hand, we got two systems for which push the data or uh, actually um, notify uh, other systems about what's going on within the CDR almost real time. Uh, we've, we have events which are based on criteria um, that can be triggered for each database operation. There's an incoming composition you want to store. You can say, well, if this composition contains body temperature and the value is above 39, please trigger either create a message and send it to a Kafka or other rabbit MQ solution, which is running outside of the better platform or execute a webhook, a post request somewhere where somebody is listening, or we have a JavaScript environment, which again, if you have a developer can serve for data pre-processing, complex validation, additional queries, recombining of the data, also stopping the transaction if necessary. So this is all based on criteria, but we also introduced some a new concept of streams. We have two channels, administrative and data streams, which actually mirror or emit events for each data-based or administrative action-based uh, operation. There's a new composition incoming. A message is sent down the data stream. Whoever's, whoever can listen to that can react on that. You can then um, of course, configure notification servers or third party servers, or you can drive the rest of the system based on what's going on with the data because EHR server is actively near real time telling you what's going on with the data or with the system itself. Next, this can, of course, this can be used for reporting, monitoring as well. And as you see here, data events, streams, or events. Um, I won't repeat everything I just said. Uh, data extracts, um, ETL tool already mentioned, query API provides additional capabilities of uh, extracting data in CSV output or streaming queries for a larger result sets so they don't choke up your line and server resources. But the main thing here is using the views endpoint. Views in, in better platform represents server side stored queries that can accept parameters that, can, that, that are based on free marker templating engine, which means they can respond to your 
a parameter set and decide how to shape the, 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 the query which internally is executed. And the data is exposed to whoever needs it. And the, the that party doesn't even need the knowledge of open air, if you will, because it's just a JSON based or XML based payload for them for whatever they ask for, of course, if the data structure is complex. Um, but nevertheless, the views, we can also provide JavaScript based views, which again, allow you to shape your responses down to the last property and value as you would like to see fit. No trace of open air if you don't want it there. So a lot of uh, options here. Uh, reporting. Now, the beta platform on its own doesn't do reporting. We're not focusing on that. We make sure that you have the ability to get to the data that you might need, as mentioned, through the ETL or views, as, as mentioned, forms when you can design the summaries. So you can design your presentation part, which you can also print into PDFs, uh, a functionality of our portal, and we'll, we are building a report generator component as well. So we are thinking about it, trying to help you out, but it's still in develop this part is still in development. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there's also an auditor API which keeps track of what's going on with the system resources. It's got a browsing API which can serve uh, for reporting purposes as well. ETL demo, well it, it's it's a straightforward thing. We have our ETL just I wanted to show you in five minutes how this is done, you can create a job and I'm going to call it export temperature data. The input is going to be my local EHR server and Postgres database as the output. If if we check my database here, the ETL output, uh, there's a single table from a different ETL process, but I'm going to export data over there. How do I export it? Um, what you do is create, um, of course, a query. Uh, so I'm going to go to the AQL builder. This is my local server connected. I want to export um, the body temperature information and I want to export the information of who this, uh, who, who this value belongs to. So the EHR ID, I want to know about which composition it belongs to. I want to know about when the composition was created. Let's run this query to test it and here it will prove what what did they do it contains limits encounter okay this is how i would i have a problem with chrome this is how i would design the query luckily my cheat sheet of course has a query designed for me already uh, i would paste it in here update the mappings and the system would do um would ask me which table i want to do i want to output this to temperature data and you see temperature uh, in my case was a quantity which is an object so I want to extract the magnitude at this point but I want to extract the unit here as well um, so this has to do with understanding how open air operates of course but the EHR ID um, in here is going to be extracted composition ID, composition date as well. And each time around, uh, I can define, decide what I want to do with the table, if it's already existing or not. I've saved my job. I'm going to run it. Let's check it out. It's completed 22 entries. How can I make sure in here? I will refresh my tables. Look at that temperature data is in there. So let's query the data and show you the output which is like that temperature unit, patient composition, date time. And of course, um, once, once you design your complex uh, ETL exports, you can automate them. You can trigger them via the API. You can schedule them uh, multiple jobs running as a group as well uh, to cover all the details, all of that available to you. And at this point, let's see what else am I doing here. Device integration. Uh, I've shown you how the Bluetooth device integration is working. Also, uh, the form on the forms directly. We have the bare uh, frameworks to include in other solutions as well. In the iOS Health Kit, which collects your uh, clinical data on iOS devices, health-related data, we've developed an, an interface that facilitates access to that data called the Health Kit Express. And for bedside device integration, we have we use the Philips 
capsule um, solution, which allows us to tap into the data streams and collect them, and of course, use them for our own purposes. Bluetooth devices of different kinds that people usually also have at home, so it will be easier to easy to integrate that with our solutions. HealthKit integration, we've exposed We've created some, some some sort of a REST-ish interface, which also supports filtering, sorting, grouping, linking data. And um, I'm running on time, low. All right, um, I have a video. I will I'll send you a link so you can see how it uh, behaves. But the last couple of slides are about security and privacy. Now, the better platform uses Keycloak as an open source product, as an identity provider. But if you're building or if you're integrating better platform capabilities into an existing system, you probably already have an IDP. So we use Keycloak as a proxy to that system. We do support token-based OAuth, OAuth, OAuth 2 flow with OpenID Connect as well. Um, all top level um, access control is based on roles. So RBAC for reading, writing, creating EHRs, creating documents, managing resources, as well as administrative roles and so on. But specific API calls for accessing specific resources um, and for data filtering is driven by ABAC, which is an uh, attribute-based access control component. I'll demonstrate that in a, in a minute. Platform can work with multiple authentication services. We have our authentication broker component. So if there's users coming from different um, um, institutions, we can tackle them all and their own individual um, backends. No need to merge all of them and migrate and synchronize and all of that. So clinical data, huh, how ABAC works. When, uh, when a user is requesting a resource or data from the clinical data repository, this request is intercepted by our ABAC component, which then loads the policies uh, from the database in turn, of course, and these policies are applied to the request depending on the type, depending on the criteria, uh, which is described within the policy itself. And now if this policy has enough information, it can provide an yes or no answer or allowed or not. But if more information can be also introduced, um, uh, if more, more information uh, needs to be introduced from external systems, um, take, for example, consent. If you have a system that, treat, that handles consents outside of better platform, you need to be able to get to that data. If you have information about who this user is, is he a doctor, is he a nurse, is he a temporary doctor, for how long, is there consent for this temporary doc substitute doctor? These are information that do not reside within the clinical data repository or maybe not even any other component of the better platform. So we need to be able to bring in that data from external sources as well. And we can bring in that data either through listeners, APIs, we can go and fetch the data, different ways of providing this information. Now, don't forget, we're still within the requesting some data from the CDR, ABAC in, um, intercepted this request, got the policies, got the external data, processed the policy and it decides whether the request is allowed or blocked. And in case of querying data, whether the data, the user is allowed to access the data or it needs to be filtered out some part of it. So this is the final response, all good or no, sorry, you can't do that. And I'll do a, a practical demo of it. I see Johan told me that your questions have been handled. So I'm gonna eat up a couple of minutes of your Q and A session uh, designed for um, uh, allotted for this slot what's the demo be all about i'll show you how the overall system works it's pretty important if you ask me to understand how this works because then uh, you get the idea what else can be handled with this um spoiler almost everything let me show you my my scenario will hide specific let's say documents of sensitive type and its data it will allow access to these documents based on specific user roles. Uh, it, will it will introduce the idea of patient consent, which can be introduced from external systems. Uh, of course, you can ABAC is plugin based, which allows you to create plugins that synchronize and get this data on their own when needed, when changed, and so on. But I'm not going to be developing a plugin today. 
uh, I will introduce relations between requestors and resources so the logical connections can be resolved and evaluated at the request time. And of course, there's always an urgency policies override as well. So how do we tackle this? First, ABAC dashboard. Of course, single sign-on, everything's here. I have two um, basic policies, one for reading the compositions, one for querying the data. Uh, I will do a set of uh, demonstrations on based on querying, but reading would work just the same. So first, let's set up the system and understand what's going on. ETL not needed, this not needed, this not needed. So I'm just cleaning up my environment. What I need for you to understand this is the key cloak here as well, um, because uh, this is where I will be managing the user's roles and privileges. And this is where I will be managing the policies. Now I need to trigger requests as well. So let's go to the demo. And this is my ABAC demo queries. All right. Initial, initial state. I'm asking for the documents and my demo environment has three documents here. If we take a look at the result set of this query, three documents, a mental health encounter summary, which is of sensitive nature, belonging to the patient identified by 5-4, another vital science encounter for the same patient, 5-4, and vital science encounter for the patient, 5-B. These were randomly assigned. If, you, if it were to me, I would create two dis more distinct patient IDs, but I think you'll be able to follow. So I got three documents. That's all in my demo repository. And I have access to all of these data, right? So if I query, for vital signs and sensitive data, we see there's a diagnosis in here, which is very serious diagnosis. I don't wanna expose this data just to anyone. So we're gonna be driving the access to this part, to this document, basically. Now, how do the roles work? Let's go back to the user itself. We find the user, the only user here is Andras Kozel, that's me. And if I check the roles available while well, I'm um, accessing the EHR, I can read and I can query data. Let's test it and see if this is really the live system. I've removed the possibility uh, or option to query data. So when I execute this system says, sorry, you can't do that. So this is the RBAC top level saying, you're not allowed to execute queries. So I introduced the, the role back, all good. Now, how do we tackle the policies? What are they exactly? Now, this is the pass through policy because it asks, does the role query exist for this patient? This information is um, passed through the token, of course. The, and um, this is the same, the same thing as the server does on its own. So this policy doesn't do really much. But I want to introduce a notation that will block access to, my, to our um, mental health encounter summary document. So see, I've said, I've introduced a rule in the ABAC no, no, um, language saying, look at that, I'm referring to the composition. I'm extracting the information about the template ID in this case was the simplest way to do and say, for any document accessed, extract the template ID, compare it to mental health encounter summary. And if that's the case, I'm not allowing it. That's how I would translate it um, to your layman's terms. So this is now policy in place. Let's trigger this request again. What happens is there's only vital signs available to whoever, to, to András Kuzel, who's accessing this system. All right, so mission accomplished. I'm hiding these documents for everyone and I'm hiding the data from these documents to everyone. Let's not forget, I'm querying the data here. If I were to, uh, to, to block the reading as well, I would copy that for the read composition policy. So I can have policies for different use cases for different operations, and I can drive them individually. All right, so I've forbidden access to this document, but still I wanna have an exemption. I wanna allow specific people to access this, uh, to access this, uh, kind of document. So you see, I've introduced uh, a logical 
um, statement of any of any of the two needs to be uh, needs to be uh, evaluated as boolean yes or positive or true in order to access the document. So either the document is not mental health encounter summary, or the patient has an access sensitive data role. All right. Uh, what did I do wrong? An extra comma here. So save policy updated. So nothing changed at the first sight, but let's go and handle our roles. Look at that. I got a role here, which I attach to my user, run the query, and I can see this document. Another user wouldn't see it unless he would have the same role in here uh, for this specific use case. Now, this works fine, but uh, it would be really an effort updating thousands of users if necessary and deciding who needs this role, what does this role do, and so on and so on. So it's too up to the point specific, too, 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 too grained, uh, fine grained to drive per role, per user cont access control. So what can we do next? Uh, I, I mentioned in my in my uh, presentation here that the scenario will say introduce the patient consent. Let's work on that. So now we are already driving who can and who cannot access the mental health uh, information. Let's introduce a patient consent. So I'll take my my policy and update it again here. And allow me, I'll explain it momentarily i don't need this this comma or this so i got the same structure as earlier so only access sensitive data role allows me access to that document but the patient has to be has to agree for anybody to access his data at all so this is the information that comes from the patient not from our uh, user management system, but from the patient. And you look at that, I'm asking if there is a gave consent entry and it matches to my EHR ID. So you see here, I'm referring to the metadata from the CDR. Here I'm referring to some information that exists outside of the system, a party it says here. So I'll save this policy and let's go and check the parties. There is no information here although the party type gave consent exists. So at this point, I would think about saying, well, I need the patient consent in order to access the data. First of all, let's check it out. No data available to me because none of the patients gave consent. All right, so policy seems to be working. So what do we do? I'm gonna use the API to attach a 5B user consent. What happened through the API I've updated the party um, entry here. This is basically the piece of information that I can add here manually. I can add through the API. I can add through the plugin where in the consent system, this patient added consent and was automatically pushed into the ABAC to be able to evaluate it, right? So at this point, if I rerun my query up here, uh, apologies, query vital signs data, not this one, but list compositions. I'll get the document for the patient that provided consent. So I'll add a second consent, run it again. Again, all of my data is now available to me because I've got both consents in. And this information comes from the patient, comes from third party system. Usually I just simulated that. All right, so what's next step? Create relations between requesters and resources. So you don't have to go user by user, document by document. Let's bring in data that comes from the backend system, okay? And what I mean by that is I will introduce a document type and a user specialty. Again, I can introduce it uh, through the API. So I've created a document type and user specialty. Let's check it in the party. There is a document that says mental health encounter summary and user a psychiatrist. So now, finally, I will take that part of the policy which I was constantly deleting, and it's this line, the fifth. It says, I'm allowing access to the document mental health encounter summary if the user's medical specialty can access this document. 
and there is no hard coded who that has to be that information resides here so psychiatrist i'm referencing it so now let's create the rule so user specialty psychiatrist can access document type mental health encounter summary this is now the rule a, a, a relation between the document type and user specialty now let's get back again and test this here i have access to all of the documents right why because uh, not this one this because i still have access sensitive data role if i remove this um let's check it i lost the sensitive document that's right but why did i lose it because now i'm just a regular gp but if that information about the medical specialty comes from the backend system and it says i'm a psychiatrist hopefully i didn't fail typing this so next step this information it passed into my user token brought to the abac abac extracts it finds a relation to the mental health encounter summary policy says that's allowed Ooh. apologies it's not it's not because it doesn't doesn't work i actually had to cough um let me let me let me check if i typed everything in psychiatrist psychiatrist it feels um it feels all right everything should be as designed you know what uh let's check the policy did i save that i didn't save the policy minor crisis averted so let's take all of that and paste it here finally saving it no heart attack this time because here it is so i got access to this document through the relation of who can do what and this data wasn't even stored well it's not necessarily stored in the abac it's provided by the third party through the api through the plugins and the information of what kind of specialty the user has comes from the backend system as well so it just evaluated in the abac and i think by now you understood the concept i could go on and on all i'm missing now is the um urgency policies override so i can introduce a break glass property which is on the top level so another just a bit of information mm -hmm. i can introduce in the Andraj, policy yes please to jump in to, to jump in also since you're now doing the abac demo and it might be too technical for me so you might have answered it but i'm gonna read it so how do you use variables content from the http request eg for example the authentication token as part of the policy rule do you know why I didn't mention that yet? Because we're implementing it in the next ABAC release. Um, the token content, the, uh, so the, the content from the token can already now be injected. It, uh, let's let's not go full Italian here. I'll show you it here. So CTX represents my context. A medical specialty is a property which was extracted from the token and inject it into the request ABEC request context. And the data from the CDR is referenced like this, EHR ID or a composition template ID. So directly through the reference model, AQL path basically. But um, as you asked, um, the HTTP request, maybe headers and other details, these are, these are the next step in the evolution of ABEC. Not here yet, but already implementing it as we speak. Great question. Thank you. But I'm happy I'm ready for it. Can't show it today, but uh, next time around we'll talk. You'll have it on screen as well. I hope this satisfies uh, your question. Uh, so yeah, all just to be conscious on the time, how much of uh, more you have to I have two to slides show. more. Two slides I more. Okay. Slides I more. guess I'll say it's okay that we finish and then we can we have enough of the time for additional yes. questions. Allow, allow me for these two slides okay. and then okay. go wild with yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. It's an All right. So monitoring, in terms of monitoring, you were asking about the options. Well, internally we have our internal statistics overview in the dashboard like that. And you can you can identify the bottlenecks of which part of the system are running slow internally within the EHR server itself. Now, this is great for administrator to take a look at, but in the administrative uh, e uh, API, we have a status endpoint which deals with um, processes, uh, caches, uh, also re-indexing or index indices, shards of those, management of those 
uh, also statistics um, and um, all the information necessary about how the system is doing on the EHR server level. There's more, so I mentioned both of them. Uh, EHR server and other components are ready for some time already for products like Isinga or Nagios or the latest upgrade, the Grafana, which is the monitoring system. We have specific endpoints published within the system. They are attached to critical components. And uh, the image to the right is actual screenshot of one of our monitoring systems, where you see we're monitoring the ABAC, the auditor, authentication broker, proxy dashboards, demographics, the EHR server and the rest. So this is this was live data. Uh, so this is what we can do in terms of uh, integrating monitoring systems on top of it, latest and greatest Grafana, uh, Prometheus metrics and underneath it, uh, Loki for uh, log management, log processing as well. We do support Aetna, uh, logging server, log stash components of output, our logs, you can fully configure them to multiple um, streams, multiple channels. You can have Elk stack with the Kibana for overview what is what's going on. I already mentioned auditor keeps tracks of resources, access and versions also on how the system is doing. Again, logs are fed into the auditor, but this API supports also browsing and filtering by resources, dates and so on. And with that, this is my, well, this was my final slide. I hope, I think we ride on time uh, for any questions. Thank you for Peter, to Peter and Jovan for backing up, but we still have time for questions. So yep. if you feel like you need more information later on, this is the address. Otherwise, thanks a lot. There, there are two fresh questions. I think the majority of the of the rest have been have been answered as much as I have followed. But uh, we'll also send you the question and answers by email, also, so you can distribute it so that they have a you know a nice overview. So okay. this one, I think you will know how to ask answer. So some IoT devices will store massive amounts of data. Not all of them uh, will need to be stored for life of the patient in EHR, yes. since they are supposed to be used by the patient himself or herself for everyday life decisions, like monitoring devices for diabetes, where data is created yes. every five minutes for years. So a lot of data, lots of data. Have you considered any process or policy around archiving and removal of the data that is not supposed to be part of the EHR? Okay, so first of all, let's tackle the devices. Some devices are spot on, you know, like you ask this, you ask uh, the device, what's the, uh, your glucose uh, value, because that's a one time measurement, and that information goes directly into the CDR. If you're asking about the uh, respiration rate, you can have a spot on measurement or an interval measurement where some devices perform these calculations for you. And when they do it across a specific interval, they they apply the algorithms, they apply the filters and provide the value which you can directly store. But nevertheless, this is why this is what the device produces, the information that the device produces. It's up to you to figure out what you want to do with it. Now, the capabilities we give you is to have access to the device, to manage this access, to get access to the actual data, to subscribe to the data, to get to updates. They're not automatically stored, but you have to develop or decide on your own strategy on how to do it. ACG, constant stream of data, but you, you can say, I'm going to sample it uh, once every 20, minutes, 20 seconds, maybe. And at that point, you take a snapshot, you store that part alone, regardless of the stream. So it's not up to the device and it, the data doesn't directly go to the platform. It is for you for grabs, but you have to decide when and how you want to store it. So I, I, I hope I've answered the first part of the question. The second part about the data retention policy, again, uh, nothing happens automatically within the platform that would also be, well, I'm not saying dangerous, but reckless. Um, it would be pretty easy to query the documents of specific type, for instance, if you're storing uh, ECG data, and then you say, well, I want to retain only the data for the past two months for this specific patient, a simple query or a view prepared for that would give you a list of um, documents that are overdue if you want to call them like that, just feed that in into the bulk delete operation. You can either archive them so they're not uh, actively um, contributing to your querying. So they become ver older versions or you can delete them, which is soft delete them. You can also then hard delete them once they are 
retired or archived. These are all operation uh, um, supported and um, in, within the our administrative administrative API part. Um, I'm not sharing anymore, right? So okay. Yeah, you are. You are. Am I now? Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I lost track of that. So what I wanted to show you is is exactly the, that. Go to the composition, and here you can hard delete compositions. You can you can um, you can delete inactive compositions, which are the archived versions as well. So it's up to you to to decide on your own strategy policy, and then it's a two step operation. We don't have an API method which calls delete the overdue compositions because from our standpoint we know nothing about what that really means uh, but it's pretty easy to to implement this um, so if that gives you enough information if not ask away i'll try to provide more oh uh, yeah in general they can archive based on the rules that can be set by the triggers and launch by event uh, sure. system we'll also have bostian joining now the call our architect so we will have a oh. support from him there is one question we are continuing now with the archiving. So is it possible to export the information in e.g. XML, for example, XML? And then as a sub question is, what role does FHIR play in this, if any? So when we are okay. talking about, you know, exporting the data. So yeah. exporting the data when I, when I, sh when, um, let, let's, let's, let's do this live. <laughs> uh, in, in REST API, we have the query endpoint which allows you to export the data in open air raw format of course csv there's streaming uh export as well but while our view capabilities allow you to well these are live views that's why there's so many of them views can um can um, um export the data or expose the data as json or xml so you serialize them in different formats and um, natively, that's two options. Um, so you can do that also when you are when you are when we are emitting uh, the streams. Usually, it's a JSON structure, but uh, we allow also compositions. When, when well, let let me let, let me show you. Maybe that this would be easier if I want to extract some data from uh, as compositions. I can load the composition, being it in a web template. Um, structure uh, canonical open air raw format or i can also load the composition as a, and serialize it as an xml as well uh, let me see if this yields any any data um, so send aha uh -huh. um, yeah the composition doesn't exist this is uh, no this is the empty ah i i did a test um deleting a composition so let's Okay, I'm trying too much. Um, we can expose data and serialize it in XML. In, the short uh, answer is yes. Cases. <laughs> yes. What fire? What's the fire's role in here? Well, not with our EHR server because that's open air based. Interfaces are open air based, our own EHR based as well. And fire server, in our case, we use it as a demographical server. So for demography data, for the operational uh, data repository as well. And it's pure fire server. Um, enhanced with uh, searching capabilities for full text search across multiple multiple um, resources and different levels beyond what uh, fire resource uh, research resource search specification allows you to do so it's an enhanced but otherwise sta standardized fire server enhanced for search capabilities so when you ask me what has fire to do here with our clinical data repository not much but we can we have other provisions to um accept fire data or expose open air data as fire resources there are components the one we're working on is fire connect community based um one the idea is to provide one mapping which would work in both directions fire to open air open air to fire community based standardized templates sort of like an what omop is for um relational database this is the uh, the analogy I draw here. You know what to expect out of the box, and of course, uh, modification and customization allowed as well for specific use cases. I'll stop here. If there's more details necessary, please ask a more detailed question. Otherwise, I'm going to spend all the time available. Okay, we'll now switch for the next questions to Bustian. So Bustian has joined the call. He is our vice president of engineering and the chief architect. So possibilities for analytics, we've touched the ETL and we've explained the export of the data warehouse. 
So you show the great patient's card. Is there a possibility to build indicators and follow them over time? Question for Bustian, and you can then add if you want uh, Andras as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Bustian, if you allow me, I just if, yeah, second. you can show. Sure. Uh, I mean, Bustian, this we'll have is the other exactly one. this following it through time, which means you can observe each time you open the patient summary, it's live updated. That's one way. If the patient makes part of any of the dashboards, you're going to see that information again updated live there as well. If you would like to have notifications in case of if there's if the patient needs focus like our Carl here, we can uh, we can use our events or streaming of the data or the events capabilities and notify the care team and focus on him. So monitoring basically is performed, is already done through the widgets as you've seen them and responding to the state through our events mechanism as well. So if, if, if this is enough information, analytics in terms of the patient state is one thing. Otherwise, if you wanna have your patient segmentation and other business analytics performed, I would I would suggest doing the ETL export of all the clinical data, pairing it with the demographics data since they reside on separate servers as well, build a warehouse, attach your BI tools onto that. And the rest of course is up to you. Um, Bostian, passing. Oh, I think you covered it enough. I, I, I thought it really well. So yes. I can only say thank you, Andras. <laughs> but but this one, this one is maybe for, for Bostian as the solution architect. So why have you chosen to use FHIR for demographics? I would leave this to Bustian, sorry. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I do believe, I mean, open EHR certainly shines when it comes to complex clinical data, but in, in terms of administrative data, FHIR really nicely covers all the, all the kind of requirements. So it has great way of ingesting ADT messages from HL7 version two. There's a lot of mappings available for that. It's simple enough to, to really work well. And besides that, I mean, we do have to separate the demographic data from clinical data. So it doesn't really hurt if we have that in, in the something that is well known and, and many people around already already use it. So for us, for demographic administrative data, I, I, I'm talking not only about the patient demographic data, so dates of birth, names, genders, and so on, but also things like encounters, location, organizational structure, things that are part of more of the administrative data within uh, acute hospitals, clinics, and other settings. Thank you. And no, I got ready I, for the for the question 18. <laughs> super, I wanted to ask you, so go ahead. Then. Yeah, the question is, are you forced to use KeyCloak? Now, I mentioned earlier, maybe it was not clear enough. If you don't have an identity provider, KeyCloak is something that Better Platform is used to work with and also designed to work with. If you have an identity provider, uh, whatever kind of it, it is, uh, um, KeyCloak acts as an identity provider proxy, which means you don't have to fill it in with the data. We just use it because we understand the API, but uh, KeyCloak can federate those queries to a backend of your choice of whatever you are using, LDAP, Active Directory, other solutions as well. So there's your backend identity provider, our KeyCloak as proxy for API calls, and nothing else is needed. So it's basically transparent. So you don't have to, uh, well, we, it comes with the platform, but it, uh, it just proxies the requests if the uh, ID, identity provider is already in place. Thank you, Andraj. And this can uh, be installed yeah. on-prem or part of any cloud service like Azure, which, which, which has that. So we, we, we interact with that already natively. Through the through through key clock. But, but just to add, I mean, yeah. you, you you can have a system also completely without key clock. So if there's a you, if you have your own identity provider which is based on signed uh, JSON web tokens, then that will work equally as well as long as you are capable of providing the permissions uh, within the content of as as claims within the content of JWTs. Both. So yes, uh, 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 Eric already wrote apologies to the more non-technical stuff for all of these questions, but yeah, we, we tried to somehow Don't mix mind. both. Yeah, in the in the beginning to have a more 
Uh, regarding long-term storage, not exactly archiving, some regions want the OpenEHR CDR to be the long-term storage. We also want this, yes. The read and RFI response from Better touches upon how to separate historic from more current data using cheaper, slower storage. Maybe, Bustian, you can uh, answer to this, so the replication yes, to- uh, Definitely. Yeah. So we have we have a built-in capability where, where certain pieces of data can be moved into a, so we can we can actually split the the database, which which really helps as as it becomes quite quite big in long term. But what we can do, we can we can split out you know historic data, either historic data or by tenancy, but mostly by historic data can be put into a different database. So just the actual composition. So the main model is still stored in the primary database, but all the composition data. Uh, can be also stored in other databases. So that means that you can have, you know, the historic data, which actually doesn't change. You can put it on some kind of read-only media, slower media, uh, if it's not regularly accessed, but you only need it every now and then, or possibly only on some special occasion, uh, that is well possible and available. So as actually, I see clarification from Eric that they can refer also to the tender response. Thanks, Bustian. Uh, there is one more question. So yeah, have I can take, you I can take redefined that, yeah. app hooks? So yeah, the, the answer is no, not really, because I mean, uh, internally, whatever integration between the better platform uh, components is needed is done on other channels, basically HTTP, HTTP remoting, but using the public interfaces. There's no there's no private APIs within the system. Everything goes through the same API calls. But for the webhook, it depends who you want to call it. How does the, that that how does that um, API look like? What so it, it's a post request with a payload. Basically, you need a listener on the other side. All you have to do on this side is define the URL where the listening where where the listener is listening at. So. For our for 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 a way how better platform components work, we don't need the event mechanism and the web hooks. It's to, for the, our customers and users' uh, disposal if you need to um, to organize something around that. So it's a convenience for you, not something that we need. So not not we don't have web hooks, but usually the users of better platform um, they have an an, an onboarding. Uh, uh, as well, so they, they they get some training, and you'll see it's a matter of minutes. You'll be able to understand it and recreate it and use it for your own purposes. This kind of stuff. So, and I'd rather see that rather than having 100 web hooks just in case, and then just confuses you. Build your own, exactly focusing on what you need. And then, okay. uh, referring to the previous question uh, to Bustian, so there is a sub question so the historic data on cheaper media it's yeah you're answering completely disparate from the point of view of aql so you can query across all of these uh data the one in the in the production more operational and then historic data the answer by I chat okay any other questions you may also jump in and ask yourselves now no need to write this was just a mechanism not to yeah, uh, Confused Andras will go I'm off the hook now so I can read it as well. <laughs> yes. Anything else, gentlemen and ladies? And ladies. Of course, we can help. There's with. actually a, and I'm quite happy there's more ladies on the. Mm. It's, it's a good thing, I guess. So, if not, I don't know, Asa, what's the yeah. procedure? Feel free to write us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You can also try all of this stuff if you want. So sandbox.better.care, uh, I can put it here. You can test. Put, put, play put with the, it to the registration form. You get the free accounts and you can test. Ah, it yes, this one is not the registration. Yeah. One. Once you register, exactly, yes. you have you get access to this. Yeah. So. And, um... Uh, this was really a great meeting to to moderate. I thought I was moderating it, but but <laughs> thank you, Jovan. You did everything for me. Um, thank you. Made it easy, uh, and I will send out information about the recording um, uh, when we have published it, and you will also all of you get a summary of the questions that got answered in the chat. Um, 
And to all of you who were listening today, thanks a lot for attending the meeting and uh, for all your questions. It was really a great contribution. And thank you, Better, for this. It was a really high in high density presentation. Uh, really good. Yes. I appreciate. Thank you for it. thank I, you for your time and 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 uh, to sticking with us. And I hope we've covered the 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 script. Uh, as much as I mean, the time allowed us. If there is anything uncovered, we are happy to answer additionally. Yeah, I think so. so and then yeah. I think we can stop the recording then. Sure. Yeah.